Good morning, everybody. Nicole here with Dear Teacher Instructional Coaching. It is a rainy morning as I am recording this. I've got my book nerd mug full of coffee, uh, ready to talk about a pretty deep topic, and that is standards-based grading. Um, I think a lot to do with standards-based grading has really been highlighted. Uh, some of the pitfalls and some of the positives have really been amplified and highlighted during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we got word in our district uh, last week, towards the end of last week, that we're not going back. And while it was expected, it doesn't make it any any less difficult. Um, it's a tough pill to swallow. But one of the things where I'm like, okay, we're gonna have to go through this anyway, right? We're going through this, we're going through this situation. It stinks, but could we get something positive out of it? Could we get a little bit of educational reform out of it? Could we have some pretty tough conversations about some things that some people are really digging their heels in on that no, this is not gonna go away, this is not gonna go away, this standards-based grading. And I'm not, let me start out by saying, I'm not entirely against standards-based grading. I think it has forced us to use rubrics the way we weren't using rubrics before. We were communicating expectations to our students the way we weren't necessarily always communicating them before. I think there have been some really good things. Um, personally, uh, that is how my brain works. I'm very analytical and I, I like I like maybe some of the wiggle room that I get with standards-based grading, even though it's supposed to be um, more black and white, it's like way more gray and fuzzy. If you're like, the teachers, you you get it, you get it. I don't need to go on and on about that. Um, but it, we've got this shift from percentages and letter grades to now standards where we have proficient, partially proficient, novice, and then on the flip side, you have advanced. And it, it, people cite all of this research that's out there and research this and research that. And our kids, our kids are more than statistics and our kids are more than a theory. They are human beings that have real things going on in their lives, <laughs> problems and issues now more than ever. And there's been a lot going on in my mind and a lot of conversations about, you know, those, aside from the fact that we have students we still don't even have contact with yet, we, the, the work that we are getting from students, some of, some kids, and I wonder, I'm wondering if this is other people's experience, some students are excelling, who weren't excelling before. And they don't have the distraction of friends. Um, they don't have the distraction of just like the regular classroom and having 25 other bodies in the room with them. It's just, it, they're almost able to focus a little bit more or to do things at their own pace and at their own time. And if they want to work um, curled up underneath their desk, then it's not bothering anybody. And who cares? So there are those those select few who are excelling. You have those who are very bright, who just continue to shine. And then you have those who did so well that are kind of turning in crap. And I'm like, what is going on? What is going on? And I feel, I feel really guilty because I feel like it's my job to prepare students for anything. Now, I didn't, would I ever think that we'd be going through the situation that we are currently going through? Ah, uh, no. I never, ever, ever would have thought of that. But I should have taught them to think critically, to think creatively, to read critically, to, re to write creatively, all of all of those things and it's just it's like those are the skills not 
Can you identify this rhyme scheme? It's not like, there's value in vocabulary. But I don't think I taught all of the skills I needed to teach for my students to just be successful human beings, not just be successful in my class. I should be teaching them things that get them to success in social studies, in math, in facts class, in tech, all of that stuff. Because I should be teaching them the grit and the perseverance and the creativity and the analysis and the critical thinking. All of those pieces I should have been more focused on rather than the content. And to be fair to myself, I kind of thought I was, but clearly not everybody was picking up what I was putting down. Um, so kind of back to the standardized grading is it makes me think a lot of uh, standard standardized testing. Now being standardized and having standards based is, I get that that's different, um, but there's still a standard that you have to meet in order to be successful. So I pulled out this morning uh, the book, Most Likely to Succeed by Tony Wagner and Ted Dintersmith. And it's been six, seven years since I've read this book. Um, but I pulled up and reread the area about uh, state standardized tests and the negative impact that they have. And there were just a couple of things that I wanted to highlight that I truly feel also relates to standards based grading. And <clears throat> it's all about the numbers and nothing about real learning or meaningful assessment. And I feel like we're trying to get to that meaningful assessment. I feel like we are being critical and we are working towards that. But are we still just doing matching with vocabulary? Or are we having kids actually use vocabulary in their writing? Like what, where's the, you know, you got to think of the level and the levels of your assessment. Yeah, you got to start at the baseline. They, they do need to know definitions, but they also need to be able to use that use that language and use it appropriately. Um, I thought it was interesting too, <laughs> how at the beginning of uh, school closures, um, what was the first thing to disappear? Standardized tests. They were out the window so fast. It was hilarious. It was like, okay, what can we cut back on? Well, clearly standardized testing. Because that's a pain in the rear end anyway. And nobody wants to deal with that again. That's... Alright. First thing out the window. If it's the first thing out the window... Doesn't that tell you something? Tell you something about the importance, about how, how it really matters? And interestingly... They tell a story in here <clears throat> about Valerie Strauss of the Washington Post wrote a column a few years, few years ago about a longtime school board member in Florida who took the 10th grade Florida Comprehensive Assessment Test, or the FCAT. This man is a senior executive of a $3 billion company, widely respected in his community, and has a BS and two master's degrees. He did what every school board member and state and national legislature should do. Throwing that out there, should do. Took the tests that they require all students to pass to graduate and which are used to evaluate teacher performance. I also know that not every state uses these to evaluate teacher performance and thank the Lord that North Dakota is not one of those states. He reports that he guessed on every math question and got 10 out of 60 correct. He did better, but poorly, on the reading, scoring at the 62% level. According to the FCAT system, 
he belonged in a remedial program with jeopardized chances of getting even a high school degree. He described the test to colleagues across a range of professions and got consistent feedback. No one used any of the test's math. He commented, it might be argued that I've been out of school too long, that if I'd actually been in the 10th grade prior to taking the test, the material would have been fresh. But doesn't that miss the point? A test that can determine a student's future life chances should surely relate in some practical way to the requirements of life. I can't see how that could possibly be true of the test I took." End quote. What's so powerful about this man's story is his reflection on the experience, and I think this is super important. He notes that if he had to take these tests as a 10th grader, his life would have been completely different. He would have been told he wasn't up to the standard of going to college, and this might have set his life ambitions lower. He concludes, quote, It makes no sense to me that a test with the potential for shaping a student's entire future has so little apparent relevance to adult real world functioning. End quote. I I just I think that that's so interesting because I think about uh, the labels that we're putting on kids. Um, it seems like and 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 that's where formative assessment has become like such a popular thing. It's about the process, not the end game. But we are still working them towards that end game, right? That's that's what we're doing as teachers. And I want to evaluate more the struggle of the learning. And I think that that's a misconception that students have, that parents have, especially parents have, is that things should be easier, not more challenging. Well, what are we doing if we're just giving everything to them on a silver platter? And I'm guilty of that too. Here is your formula for how you write an informative paragraph. Follow the formula and you'll be fine. But I've gotten great writing that breaks that mold. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's creative and critical thinking. That's creative and critical writing. And it, it's like, here's this formula. It's super easy. Follow it. I'm just teaching them to be standard. I'm not teaching them to be creative. I'm not. I'm not teaching them to branch out. And I think so much more, and I give myself some grace. One thing that I love to do <clears throat> is there is never something I assign to my students, especially writing, that I don't also do with them. So when we wrote our argumentative essays this year, I wrote one too. And probably the best part of that learning would be when I put like a paragraph up that I wrote and I'm like, I just don't like this. This sounds funny, this seems weird to me. And we would talk through it as a class and that was the powerful part. But where's that standard? How is that assessed? That good, strong, communication, that good, strong learning. It's just a battle. It's an absolute battle and things are so fuzzy right now and it's like, we have a lot of students who are going to get IEs, which means insufficient evidence. So what that means for our district, that's different than being not applicable. Not applicable is we didn't assess it and we pared down our standards for the, obviously, for quarter four with all of this going on. And so, because we pared that down significantly, um, we then, like, where was I just going with that? I lost my train of thought because I yawned. And then I was thinking about the fact that I was yawning while I was filming. Um, <laughs> hmm. We took our standards, we pared down our standards, 
and it still it still isn't enough because that learning that me guiding isn't happening and sure oh I've made the videos I've I we had to, our kids had to do a five paragraph essay mm-hmm the five paragraph essay don't even get me started on my feelings about the five paragraph essay worthless um <clears throat> But that aside, that's what we agreed was going to be like kind of the, a big thing because we were going to hit conventions and writing content um, and then a couple comprehension things too. So research being a really, really, really big deal and a really big focus, which I appreciate. Uh, however, with this essay, my kids had already written like the argumentative essay before. That was fine. Um... And so when they wrote this like final piece this year, I did have the videos that talked through like, this is what I'm doing. God, that sentence sounds funny, but I don't know how to fix it right now. So I'm going to come back to it in my editing video. But what if they didn't watch the editing video? And also, it's just me talking to myself. It's not me getting ideas from them. They're just sitting back and passively watching me do this. How is that engagement? How is that helping them? And granted, I really don't know how else to have made things more successful during this time. Um, maybe doing more of like a project-based learning project would have been something a little bit more beneficial to students. Um, setting up groups to get them to collaborate a little bit more. But I also didn't scaffold for that. I. I didn't prepare them to be able to do something like that. Um, because of this fear, I guess, that I would have of, of some of my classes. I had a pretty tough class this year. And anytime we did anything collaborative, I was so worried about it because somebody was going to blow up, somebody was going to storm out of the room, something, something was going to happen and it caused me a lot of stress, it caused me a lot of anxiety and so instead of, instead of, you know, dealing with the blow ups and really working through that, even though I did that, I refrained from doing too, too much. Like I can't keep doing this because this is just so incredibly disruptive and it was just, it was very challenging. And so where's that balance? And how do you find that balance? And I just don't want the standards and the standards based grading to kill our kids creativity. That's what I don't want. I can't, and there's a part of it where it's like, I like, I, you know, I mentioned before, I like the wiggle room that comes with um, standards based grading because I've got like that vision of the three, I've got the vision of the proficient, but I don't always have the vision of the four. And there's also things to the effect of, so for example, I've got a rubric sitting in front of me right here. <clears throat> and so um, for essay structure, a three is clearly introduce the topic, Organize the information into body paragraphs, provided a conclusion that summarized the information. Okay. So the difference between a three and a two is, a two is introduce the topic. It's just not clear. Clearly is gone. Uh, same body paragraphs. And then the conclusion is unclear. How can a conclusion be unclear? It's like there's that vagueness, but then like if a student says something like within their conclusion, then I'm like, I don't really, it's like, is it whether or not they have the conclusion or is it whether or not the conclusion is good? Because this says structure. And if they got the structure, they got the structure, right? They have the intro body and conclusion. They have the five paragraphs. So, And then the difference with the four is that the conclusion not only summarizes the information, but could lead 
to the reader taking action. So there's some type of call to action in an informative. You have the wiggle room, but it also makes things sort of unclear for kids. Um, it's kind of nice for me because then I get to I get to define things based on my my expectations, and I have very high expectations of my students. It's just such a challenge because some people just hate it so much, and I we need we need to have like a set like this is what kids need to know but some sometimes i think that what we're asking our kids to know isn't the right stuff i was um <clears throat> watching so penny kittle and kelly gallagher were doing um, morning talks and they started it when the pandemic started and there were school closures and they did it for uh, 30 weekdays. So they decided to suspend it for a little while, but one of their topics um, that they briefly touched on was the idea of what is the importance of grading at this time? Like, are we really going to fail a kid because they're the oldest sibling and they have to watch their younger brothers and sisters during the day because that's bull? We can't do that. And and my district told us to cut, like, way back. And we, did, like I said, we cut down our standards. And, out like, my curriculum coordinator had said, cut back and then cut that back. Like cut it in half and cut the half in half because it's just going to be too much. And right away I was like, it's not gonna be too much. They're gonna be fine. We had kids emailing us because we didn't launch, we're such a big district that we didn't launch content until April 1st. We got that forgiveness from our governor. Like that's when content had to start, though some schools started it earlier. Um, we started it right away April 1st. And so it was, we had students in those like two weeks, week and a half, who are emailing us like, we're bored, we're so bored. So we came up with these challenges and that was super fun and those kinds of things, but the, that has since like died off. Now that like content is very deep and we are getting a lot of missing work. Um, so I was lucky because my district told us to cut way back, but I think still, most of us, myself included, didn't cut back enough. Sure, I had one thing that had to be turned in per week. So at the most two, at the very most two things, but it was typically just one thing due per week. But there was a lecture video, there was an example attached, there was a video of me doing the example attached, the rubric, and then the assignment. That's five things in the folder. So even though they're only turning in one thing, there's that process. And there's a couple of things I guess I, I could have done differently um, with saying like, this is what you do Monday, this is what you do Tuesday. But in my mind, it's easier to do all of that in one fell swoop because we would have done it in like back to back days. It would have normally just taken us two days to do some of this stuff and I'm like, okay, you're going to get seven now, so you should be able to easily do this. And I guess there's also a part of me who was like, I didn't expect the encores to require so much. And I didn't, I didn't expect some of the other contents to require as much work. And I thought, well, if I'm doing one assignment, but there's five pieces, including the assignment itself, and that's just for me. And these kids have six classes in a day. That's 30, 30 things that they would have to do. Granted, I know that that's not totally the case because some people it's just, you know, like do 20 minutes of exercise a day and log it or take a picture of it or whatever. But it's just like, I feel like we've just given them like a bunch of stuff to do and not really done a very good job of assessing 
and making sure that they're very meaningful and really cutting back on some of the the stuff we've assessed on already. And I don't want to say unimportant stuff because I mean I'm I'm a nerdy language arts teacher. I think all of my standards are super important. <laughs> so um but things that maybe we don't necessarily need to hit on or focus so much on because we've hit them already this year. But I still don't think I cut back enough. I'm still not getting the best quality of work. I'm <coughs> being very forgiving when I am grading. Because I have some students who I'm like, I... I just firmly believe that if we were still in school, based on everything that I have known about you for the first seven months of the year, I I know you are a three. I know you are proficient. I know you can write this if you would have had me there with you. If you would have been able to go through the process with me instead of passively watching me. And I just, I hope... I hope that all of this brings about educational change and educational reform and for us to think even deeper about our assessments. Are these are these things real world ready? And I'm gonna pull something else up from again, most likely to succeed. But it talks about um there's on page two hundred and twenty. It says, uh, what can teachers do in the classroom? It says, we hear from teachers, I am committed to helping my students develop critical skills. That's where I'm at, but where do I start? We'd encourage the teachers to take the following steps. So find and team up with a trusted colleague. So having support of another colleague. And I am super lucky because one of my very good friends is also on my team. She's the science teacher on my team. And we talked a lot about how, like, <clears throat> how we can help each other a little bit more, especially at the start of the year. Because she's saying, the kids aren't reading the directions. And we've had a good conversation about, is it that they're not, or is it that they don't get what to do? Because we haven't taught them how to read directions. And so she talked about how she's gonna change the way she does labs. She goes, things might take a little bit longer, but so what? Then I'll cut some things out. Because I need to give them the lab sheet the day before, and we need to put boxes around the verbs so they know what are the things they have to do. That's what the verb is. And go through that stuff and talk about that stuff. And I told her too, I said, if you're not comfortable, you know, with that or confident with that, we could either talk about it before or you give me that sheet the day before. And we're going to talk about text structure and we are going to talk about verbs and we are going to go through and... Make sure that they have a good understanding of what they have to do and then you hit content. So that's something to do is to find a trusted colleague. The second thing um, that they say is review the tasks, quizzes, and assignments you give students. Assess them on the basis of how memorization intensive they are. Could anyone with access to online search have answered the questions? Do these assignments help your students develop critical skills and how? And so there's something to be said, and I, I love, like, whenever we do papers and things like that, like, they have a, there's a lot of student choice involved in that. And we do synthesis charts, and we Steve Dunn things, and all that kind of stuff. And it's like there's, yeah, they can plagiarize, but there's really no way to, like, actually cheat. Because it's your ideas, you just gotta make sure you cite your sources with those because we require explanation not just a list of facts from sources so but there's still other things that I'm like is that the best way to assess that standard probably not I need to go back and and assess some of the assignments and the quizzes and tests that I'm giving my students both formative and summative um, gauge how much talk time in your class is your lecturing compared to student-led discussions and I think about that and I think that it's not even necessarily like student-led discussions as much as it is just like student work time. And I need to get them out of their silos and out of um, independence and get them to being uh, more collaborative 
with one another, working together on things a little bit and having having like writing groups. And this is your writing group. This is the group you talk with about your writing for like the whole year. This is what you're gonna, this is who your go-to people are. And you're gonna help each other learn and grow because they're gonna learn so much from each other as, as they are from me too, if not more from each other. Um, it says, uh, an idea that they give about the teacher talk time versus the student-led discussions is to film yourself, and there's a whole bunch of ways that you can do that, but if you wanna keep it super simple, uh, pop open your computer or just use your phone or an iPad. As long as it's for personal use, for you to assess your own teaching, there is nothing wrong with that. Just don't like, post that anywhere. Um, and they recommend that if it's more than 20%, oh, um, what's your like your percentage of air time if it's more than 20% so if you as the teacher are talking more than 20% of the time try to get yourself down to just 20% of the time uh, the fourth thing that they say teachers can do in the classroom um, is are students assessed on the questions they ask as well as the questions or answers they provide and that just kind of that's funny because that makes me think about what I said about you know, how come I'm not assessing the conversations that are happening about what we're talking about? That's deep thinking. That's that's formative assessment right there. And, and honestly, their discussions can be and should be also a form of summative assessment, the deep conversations they have. And then the last one that Tony Wagner and Ted Dintersmith recommend is number five, do students have opportunities to create their own projects define goals, develop their plan, and communicate their achievements to a broader audience? Can a student afford to make mistakes and fail and still do well in your course? What percentage of the time they spend is on self-defined projects? If it's less than 20%, try to get there. And I love that whole authentic audience piece I think about, say for example, you did, and I'm, I'm lucky now that I work in a very large district that is very community oriented, and I live in a community that is very, very willing to always talk with kids, always work with kids, always make kids better. Like we have an awesome community here. And it would be so difficult for me to have gotten somebody to come out to my rural school before. Um, it just would have been a little bit more challenging. Whereas here, it's like, hey, you know, take an hour out of your day and come talk to my class for 30 minutes. And um, so many people are so willing to do that, but I think it would be interesting to have, you know, if they did group projects, like something like, uh, creating a commercial and focusing on like media and your message and kind of some marketing aspects of it but really focus on like the including multimedia components and using persuasive techniques would be really cool but then having somebody or a couple of people who are involved in marketing like come in and talk about those types of things that are really like important or cool or like what you need to think about when you're doing marketing and then for them to be the one to give the kids feedback. They should give the kids feedback. And yeah, I'll toss down there a grade, whatever, but if they gave kids feedback, like, you know, I think that your guys' commercial was really successful, but there was one thing that was odd, and this is what was odd, and this was why. It would be really cool to get like some of those insights back and then give the ch kids the chance to do it again. But then, just, I mean, you know, you, you can only ask so much of like your business community in your city. But I think it would be really, I, I need to, I need to involve community experts a little bit more. Um, and so I guess all of this goes back to, this turned into like a huge just blabbering of um, grading because it's and it's not it's not just standards based it's really not I feel guilty because I don't think I prepared the kids very well that's been hard and I'm sure a lot of teachers are feeling the same way um, I know there's also teachers out there who are blaming the kids 
for not knowing some of this stuff. And I was like, but how much did we enable them? How much did we just hand it over? How much did we set the bar too low when it should have been raised? So I, I don't, I don't put any of this on the kids. I put it all on me. And that's kind of a hard, hard burden to carry, but I'm using it I'm not like wallowing and like, oh my gosh, I've destroyed these children because I haven't. I still did a dang good job with them. Um, but it's not my best, you know? And it's like, here's the deal. I've, I'm finishing my 10th year of teaching. I've been teaching for 10 years. I, I still am not my best. And I don't think I'm ever going to be my best. There will always be something new to learn. There will always be new strategies. There will always be new things to try, new ways to connect with kids, <laughs> new initiatives that are gonna come through our doors. And I think it's important for us to think about not what's best for us, not what's easiest for us, and honestly, not what's easy for kids because they're gonna grow in discomfort that's where they're going to really flourish as human beings is when they become uncomfortable with stuff. And so while I appreciate things with grading and with assessment and standards-based grading and there's, there's good stuff there, it's maybe not assessing the right stuff. And I think maybe we need to reconsider what we teach, how we teach, and what's really important. And so those are the conversations that really need to happen based off of our feelings about how we are grading these kids, especially during these school closures. So with that, lots to think about. Um, kind of could easily keep rolling with grading, but um, I am approaching dang near 40 minutes. So um, I have meetings to go to, I need another cup of coffee I gotta brew, and just keep, keep thinking about it, keep working towards being better, give yourself some grace and give your kids some grace, but if you're feeling guilty, in a similar way that I am, use it as fuel to get better. Because we as teachers need to showcase what we expect from our students, and that's to learn, and that's to struggle, and that's to be uncomfortable, and all of that leads to growth. Have a really, really awesome day with love.